by the time I was 18, 19, I bought my first house. Who at 22, do you know, owns six properties? Four to five grand came from wow. selling sweets at school. From when I was like 15, 16, I, I planned I wanted to do property. From property, I wanted to sort of work for myself. And then from working myself, I just wanted to be semi-retired. What point do you think, is there a retirement point? Is there an end goal? Welcome to the All Things Property Podcast with me, Jamie Bowles. Today, I'm joined by James. James is a 22-year-old property developer and entrepreneur who already owns six houses and he only started three years ago. So, James, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. And I can't wait to discuss All Things Property with you. But what I'd really like to start with is how did you get into property at 19 years old? For most people, that's unthinkable. Well, for me, it was literally just going through Facebook one night and I seen a uh, property training sort of thing in Redcar with Stephen Green. Okay. Yep. Uh, basically, took myself down there about 17 years old uh, on the train. 17, you went to a... Okay, cool. Yeah, 17, took the train all the way through to Middlesbrough and then I think it was like just a bus to this area where they had the, uh, the training group. It was just... I loved the energy off everyone. Okay. All the energy was positive and then I did a... The, there was a three-day course they were charging like two or three grand for, but they just basically just got me on it for, for next to nothing. I think I paid like, what, 50 quid. Uh, and then from there, it was just all buzz, but it turns out you can't start your limited company until you're 21. So I had to basically just save, save, save. And by the time I was 18, 19, I bought my first house and then renovated that. Uh, so, it. so you bought your first house. So, yeah. when you bought your first house, did you buy it as a first-time buyer? Did you buy yeah, it under a limited buyer. company, or uh, yeah, it was a first-time buyer. Uh, bought it for myself. Okay. So uh, it was your main residential property. Yeah, yeah. It was only it was only actually mine for about four or five months. Okay. Uh, then we got it uh, rented out, and then by the time I was, I think it was like twenty, maybe t just turned twenty-one. By the time everything was went through the solicitors, everything, all the renovations was done, and then my limited company bought it so then so you had to pay stamp duty again uh, yeah some people don't realize this is when you're buying when you've got a property in your own name and you transfer it to a limited company they don't realize a limited company is its own entity so yeah. it's not you a lot of people get this mistake where they think oh well, it's, it's my company i own it so it's yeah. the same thing it's not you have to have a set of solicitors for you a set of solicitors for the limited company and it all sounds a little bit really silly, well, to <laughs> especially even, if you're the only shareholder. So. To make it even worse, that was the same time that I bought my second property as well. Right, okay, so, so it mixed over in the two. So okay. two sets of stamp duty, two sets of solicitor fees, and then I had the renovation fees at the end of the second property as well as all the other fees from the wow. one I was transferring over. So and how did you get the money to do this? Where did that come from? A lot of, well, my first initial lump sum of about four or five grand came from selling suites at school. I was one of those. Did you say kids. four to five or forty five? Four to five grand came from wow. selling sweets at school. Um, I was going to say forty five grand is a lot. Of kids. I wish, There's a lot I wish of sweets like and a lot but, of kids. Um, there. And then as soon as I was sort of, I left college. Uh, so you sold sweets at school. Yeah. The money you then where did you where did you put the money? I put the money into stocks and uh, stocks and shares. Stocks, I, what online just, trading? Yeah, just day trading. Day how trading. did you learn how to do a day trading? Uh, well. There's like there's like a trading well I'll say trading period. There's a, a period from leaving secondary school to leaving uh, sorry to start in college. Right. Which is about four or five months. I was like all my pals were just going on holidays and stuff. I was like right I need to do something. Here. So you can't you yeah you got. So I just I basically I didn't pay for any courses. I literally just looked on YouTube and learned how to day trade. How'd you find it? <sighs> Bit of a rough start, but okay. yeah I made a fair whack from that. How much did you make? Probably. Maybe eight, nine grand from it on top of... On top of the four to... Wow. In, uh, in that short time span, it's about four to five months. Yeah, I mean... And you're was... not selling Forex and trading on Instagram with fake Lamborghinis? No, no, no. <laughs> so I... I got... So many people would if they were earning that kind of money. <laughs> my, my first trade was literally... It was like a sell on oil literally the day before COVID and it was just potluck. Right. Uh, that just... Well, it went all the way down and then I was like, I'll sell it. It went all the way down, I'll sell it and then buy it. It wasn't like some kind of... I wasn't onto something, I was just very lucky. Okay, and well then, at least you're humble enough to admit it. Yeah. yeah, and then literally, sort of after that, uh, went back into college, finished college, uh, then it was like, what do I do myself? I joined the Navy. You joined the Navy, okay. Yeah. Uh, then I put- What that, made you want to join the Navy? Uh, well, I'd, I'd say I probably had like a military upbringing. Uh, my dad was in the army for about maybe three or four years and then was in the police for about 25. So it's okay. always, I've always been, I've not been pushed into it, but it's sort of been like, I've seen it as 
yeah, that's probably for me. Looking back now, yeah. I'd probably say not. But <laughs> yeah, so I uh, once I finished college, joined the Navy. It was the start of COVID. So we all got sent back home for about four or five months again. And I was just sat there, same predicament, just like, right, I need to do something here. And then everybody was on about this crypto. So I just banged. Ah, yes, crypto. Okay, yeah. So I banged a little bit of money in there. Not enough to make enough money, but that's where my pot came from. Okay, what did you invest in? <sighs> Everything, really. It was Bitcoin. And that made so, you money? Yeah, it made, it made enough for me to just be like, right, we need to start actually putting this somewhere where it's, well, it's called like a tangible asset, isn't it? Yeah, okay. Um, so then the Navy did this thing where it's like a help to buy scheme. So they give you something like 13, 14 grand wow. towards your first house, which is when I bought my first house because I was just like, right, this is an interest-free loan. This, this is... So they gave you a loan. They didn't give you the money, but it's interest-free. Interest-free. For what period of time? You get it for 10 years, but mine's already paid off now. I paid it off right on. about two months after the, the deal sort of got remortgaged because all the remortgage, I was sat with this even bigger lump sum. I was like, right, let's get this paid off. Then yeah. we'll start looking for something else. Where so many people will just take the money and think, oh, I've got this big pot of cash. Where can I put it now? And then before they know it, they're like, oh, I've still got this debt liability over here yeah. and this <laughs> debt over here. And then before you know it, that debt mounts up. Well, so that's I think that's super responsible. Well, yeah, Especially for someone who was 21. That's how the, the Navy get their attention is through sort of that help to buy it's like another incentive to stay right retention's down at the moment and it's just all these little things that they, they try and do to keep you keep you in okay so help to buy you done yeah. that use the money from the navy you yeah. paid it back second property what made you want to go into a second property did you have the envision of do, when you bought the first property was it your idea to renovate that and use it as a buy okay. to let 100%. that was always your plan yeah okay. so i was, I was sneaky quite, i, like I was it, quite yeah. fortunate that the house that i bought the the next door neighbor um lovely gay couple they they've been watching me do this renovation and their house has just fallen a bit. So like the second you're you're done and ready to rent it now, we'll come in. So I was So what they were gonna rent it off you? Oh yeah, brilliant. So they Even better. just moved from their house into mine and just started renting it out and then yeah. I was like, right, this is this is gonna work this. This is money for all growth. So what did you pay for the house? So what did you pay for the house as a bulk? Uh, probably about hundred thousand. Hundred grand. Okay, yeah. what was the renovation costs? Less than ten. Maybe. Okay, that's pretty uh, push good. Me probably 12. Uh, okay, so you're 100, 112 in. Legal fees, you've got stamp duty yeah. as well. So let's say... Well, it was my, my first my first. Of course, yes, there's no stamp so, on it. Yeah. I mean, obviously when I bought it again, I got the stamp. But, yes, the limited company. Uh, but but it's the initial first. purchase, I mean, I think got revalued at maybe one, 140 to one. Okay, nice bit of profit. I haven't, I haven't seen the... Seen the paperwork because obviously it all goes through the broker and he's just sort of helping me and he's just like, oh, there's the money. And then the solicitor sends you that big whack and you just see it. I was driving home with me, pal, and it got sent through because he was doing the music on my phone. And he's like, what's what are you getting paid this much money for? And I was just That's like, the best feeling, isn't it? Yeah. I was just like, right, it's it's all coming. But it goes. I don't know about you, but if I get those big lump sums in, it's gone. It's already been I've already been invested it somewhere before it even comes in. It so. went about a month later. Yeah, yeah. It went on the next house. Yeah, that's um, it. So, and, and how much were you rent? So if you put 110 grand in, how much were you renting that particular house out for? Uh, it's it's not a lot to be fair. Uh, I can get more. I've got about I think it's like 600 pound a month. Okay. So I, I can get more. For so it. it's not a huge yield. Oh no, no. I mean, I could take the mick with it. Um, I don't know if you get emails. I get emails off like letting agencies asking me. And sort of one of called us the other day was asking, "Oh, are you renting out the property? How much are you renting out for? We can get this for you." But I'm just like. That gay couple are going to be in there forever. Yeah. Um, and that's another house I've got. So my, my first two houses I think, yeah. are just like, one's my uncle and the other one is obviously that couple there and they're never going to move. So I'm just, that's my pension pot. I think my biggest, I mean, first of all, I would say never bank on that. Yeah. Because um, you'd be surprised. Um, the second thing I would say is it's something that I really detest in the market at the moment. So all of us landlords get tarred with the same brush. Yeah. But ultimately you've just shown there that you were, building this portfolio, you're building this house up, you know, you've renovated it, mm -hmm. and your aim is to basically get some long-term tenants in so you've got a stable income, yep. which is the right thing to do. That's what so many buy to let landlords do. They buy a house, they rent it out, the rent covers the mortgage, they get maybe a little bit of extra on there as a cash flow, but ultimately that's not what makes them the money. The money is coming from the, the uplift and the value of the property over time. Yep. And then there is where your equity sits and that's where the money's made. I think the biggest problem now is there's too many greedy people in the market. So where I am now, I could buy a house for, well, I have bought a house um, for 60 grand. 
I renovated it for about 30, so I'm in about you know 90-ish grand. I'm, I'm valued at around about 170 on it now, so it's a good uplift, but it's a good little house. Got it off market, it's a good deal. Problem is, I could put it on the market now and I know I could achieve 1,500 quid. No problem. But the market doesn't, you know, if you look at the comparables, realistically, I should be charging around 1,100 to 1,200 a month. But I know I can get that extra money because it would be gone straight away. What's because the there is thing? such a demand at the moment. You have tenants queuing for properties. And I don't know if that's down to individual landlords being greedy. I don't know if that's down to just poor um, housing stock that's on the market. Because there's so many, if you go on Rightmove or Zoopla right now and you look at houses to rent, I'm going to sit and say 60% maybe even more than that, are properties that I go, oh God, really? You know, their bathrooms oh. are 30, 40 years old. The kitchens are all falling apart from the night. Why, it's how, the, it's, it's terrible. I don't understand I it. Think, I think a lot of it comes from the fact that a lot of property up north is owned by people down south. Yes, so, I also know this is true, yes. So what happens is, uh, well, my, my contact from where I bought uh, the houses that I've just bought from, uh, she, owns, she owns streets in Darlington in, I mean, from the property that I've seen, these ones that I've just bought in, I think it's very much sort of they're up north, people renting them out, let's forget about them. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's sort of a... I, I agree with that as well, yeah. I don't think it's much sort of care, to yeah. be honest. I think the money's coming in, people pay the rent. And I think it. people see it as cheap. Yeah. So for example, I would never buy a house in, let's say Middlesbrough. So there's some areas in Middlesbrough where I could pick a house up right now for 20 grand. And I know I could get a tenant in there on LHA, which is the local housing authority rental rate. I know I could get a tenant in there paying 550 a month, and I could put next to no work into it. I know it gets snapped up within two days. The value of the property won't go up, the area's not very nice. Um, but a lot of people do that. Yeah. A lot of people it's think, easy, oh, I'll just buy it, it's easy cash. And then they say, oh, I own six properties. Yeah, but the equivalent of those six properties is probably only worth 150 grand. It's not really a property portfolio, is it? So yeah, I think a lot of people look at that in a, in a different way. With our properties, what we do at Your Home Group is we always ensure that the renovation is done to a set standard. So I won't take, I won't work with a client who wants to just do some, let's whack some cheap carpet and keep the old kitchen in, just try and make do with some glue, so glue and activate a bit of silicon. It's, I'm just not into that, you know, because at the end of the day, your lettings will be dealing with a tenant. And I would never rent out a property to a tenant that I wouldn't personally want to live in. And I think that's the worst thing as a property developer. When I first started, I finished like HMOs or any houses and I was like, I used to say to my partner, oh, we, we should move in there, that's really nice, I really like it. And it made me realise that I loved, even my HMOs, I would genuinely live in the rooms in my HMOs. I just, I, they're done to a standard that I think are great. You know, I put a lot of passion, hard work into it. So if I wouldn't live in it, I'm not gonna rent it out to you, simple as that. And I know from that, that people are gonna respect and, and, and care, not always, because I've had a lot of people trash properties, but the majority of people were respect and care for How did you get around yeah. that? So I had a, it's really difficult. So when I first started out, I, I made a lot of mistakes. I made a lot of mistakes. So my second ever property investment was a HMO. And that was a huge learning curve for me because the tenants I had in there to start off with were not good tenants. I had a recommendation from a friend of a mate who, you know, who was in a pub and he was like, oh, I really need this place to stay. And I was like, okay, sure. Well, the rents, let's say, I think it was 450 a month, all bills included. Deposits 450. Oh, I can pay you know, like maybe 225 now and 225 now. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. No problem at all. You know, I'll, I'll be, you know, they're, they're a friend of a friend kind of thing. They move in. Next thing you know, it's like, oh, there's a party going on. I'm like, what? Oh, you know, I'm getting texts at two in the morning. Oh, this person upstairs nicked all the plates, knives, and forks, and this person's taking a shit in the toilet. You need to come and clean it. Shit. Literally, I've had those messages. Um, and then, like, there's one particular tenant who, uh, it's quite a sad section, actually. He, um, he held his, his girlfriend hostage and uh, sexually assaulted her as well. And the police had to essentially raid and knock down the doors. And yeah, it wasn't very nice for other tenants. So, I mean, realistically, I didn't know that was going to happen. And I did do a background check on that tenant still. But the point is, I've learned now that my business model to start off with of just doing a basic HMO and renting it out to whoever was not what I wanted to do long term. So I completely pivoted my, my marketing model, my business model on the HMO side of things and basically done high-end HMOs. So all rooms had pre-built beds in them, really nice uh, furniture, 50-inch TVs built into the walls, um, like smart locks. The carpet was high-end. 
it like uh, I'm talking things like duck feather uh, right, pillows so and like, stuff like that. You, you transferred across simply just you wanted to kind of the higher end people running them out. Yeah, so now my tenants are doctors, nurses, uh, high end managers, and I find a lot of my tenants How now. Do you source them? Uh, do you know what? Actually, just by having good properties and advertising it well, so if I advertise my properties on Rightmove, Zoopla, then I find that I get an influx of the right tenants. So if I'm charging, so for example, let's say Warrington, right? So Greater Manchester. Have you ever heard of Warrington? Yep. So in Warrington, I've got a couple of high-end HMOs. So one of my high-end HMOs is all just doctors and nurses. And it's a case of when they come and work in the NHS, um, they come from abroad. They're highly skilled. The NHS put them into um, short-term living accommodation. It's not that nice. They're always looking for new places to stay. They can't find anything to rent. It's super expensive. Usually they've got families that might live in London or down south. They don't particularly live in that area. So they, they're just looking for a nice place to stay short term. They don't want to rent some of these HMOs because they're full of people that are, they don't really want to associate with or not kind of like, like them. So they'd rather pay £600 a month to myself to have like this high-end HMO, kind of luxury living, private car parking, literally next door to the hospital, walk in, walk out, and at the weekend they go back to their families in London. So that I, I have a lot of tenants like that. Um, I wouldn't say I have any tenants that are on less than 50 to £60,000 a year which most people would be like, wow, really? They, they rent HMOs? And I'm like, yeah, because the people that are on this kind of huge money, um, they, they don't want to have these big luxury houses. They don't need that. They just want someone nice to stay short term while they're working here. When advertising a property at like 600, I think it usually puts a certain tenant group off because they might see other HMOs going for 350, maybe 400 a month. And those HMOs will have cheap beds, cheap mattresses, a huge shared kitchen, all, you know, the bathrooms are shared with six or seven people. And that's okay for some tenants. That's that's all they need. They just need a base. Whereas with our properties, a lot of tenants are looking for the higher end kind of HMO, you know, the ones that are more professionals. So they don't mind spending 600 a month because they've got their own private bathroom. They've got their own kind of furniture all there. They can literally just turn up, put their clothes in drawers and then leave again. Everything is there. They don't need anything else. Um, so it's, a, it's more of a high end living. And, and that's kind of how I pivoted over the years from um, the, the basic HMOs to the more higher end HMOs. And it's a lot more profitable as well. You get less drama, less headaches. The maintenance bills are incredibly less. Uh, they used to be insane. Um, I used to have tenants probably leaving once every six months, maybe more um, in HMOs. I cannot tell you, the, it's countless the amount of tenants that just done runners. They just literally just left. And I would have to go through the whole process of serving Section 21s or Section 8s and, and trying to get access to the property and the rooms would be locked and it was an absolute nightmare. I lost so much money from it, but I learned as well. And it's just a learning process and that's it. So, yeah. so from, Honestly, that's where I'm at now. So, uh, yeah, a lot so, of the stuff I'm picking up is just day by day. Yeah, and that's always how it starts. You know, you can't, it's it's easy for people to portray they can teach you these things and put you on these expensive courses yeah. and, oh, I can teach you how to be a property developer. But how are you going to deal with a situation where you've got a tenant who's, let's say, you know, all of a sudden uh, vulnerable and they can't pay the rent? How do you deal with that? You can't train that. Yeah. You know, you, there's a certain level of land. You have to be a certain character to be a good landlord, I think. If you're just in it to make money, you shouldn't be in the game. It, it, yeah. At the end of the day, it's a business. Mm -hmm. It is a business. So you have to be a very good business person to run a property development company where your ultimate business model is to buy property and rent it out to, to, the, to the client. Uh, which is also the tenant, but it's a business. You have to be um, very good at doing that, basically. Uh, it's not an easy job. So a lot of people that come on here and say, yeah, I manage all my own tenants and I buy my own properties and I refurb them, they will, you know, which is sim similar to where the path you're starting, they will admit that it's not easy, it's hard, it's challenging and there's a lot to learn. It's not just a simple case of, oh, well, I'll put it on uh, an open rent, find yeah. a tenant quickly. Oh, uh, there's an AST. You know, what about the how to rent guide? Do you know how to do gas safety? You know, how do you manage all these things? EICRs? That's, that's the, because obviously I have a lot of mates who all want to get into property and it's like, the, I talk about it to them. Yeah. Or I try and have the same chats that me and you are having. And it's like, well, I want to get into property. As if it's like something that we can just like pick why, up. Why is it fashionable now for everybody to want to get into property? What do you think? I think that's down to basically Instagram reels. As, as horrible as Which is it's, where you found me. <laughs> yeah. But, okay. but, but I mean, I was, I was doing property years before that. I, I seen you on Instagram reels. But I think a lot yeah. of it is people think, oh, uh, 
one of them that does my head in is Grant, Car- uh, Grant Cardone that okay. always has like a picture of him in the jet or something and talking about buying houses and that's what everybody wants and I mean who doesn't want that and I think that's why everybody's like oh the buying houses gets you to that really quickly I totally if, agree with you as yeah. if as if me slogging out yesterday doing yeah. the loft insulation and uh, pointing on the, the bottom bit of the brick where it goes yeah, like yeah, down. Yeah, yeah. And I'm laid there like on the, what you call it, Great Escape, on the rafters as they're going into the tunnels. And I'm <laughs> yeah, just, I've been there. I'm I know the like, feeling. Yeah. I don't feel like I'm on a jetty here at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know it. I mean, I spent probably the best part of four years just me on my own with my van, my trusty Vauxhall Vivaro, full of tools. And I literally work. I would leave my house at 3.30 in the morning, drive all the way to Manchester, I'd build all day. I'd then sit in the hotel room on my laptop in the evening or a room that I was renting, doing all the paperwork I could, negotiating on other property deals, uh, dealing with ordering um, materials and stock for properties, dealing with some um, subcontractors. And I'd literally just get there slugging away nonstop. And I'd be doing 18 hour days. And it was, it was nonstop relentless. And I genuinely, I think that's why I lost all my hair. Because <laughs> I used I'm to have a lot now. of hair. I used to I be up to there hair. at that point and now yeah. I'm all the way back. That's, that's property. <laughs> and that's Literally, this is property. <laughs> so anyone who wants to get into property, and I really mean this, you have to take into account that it's going to be years of hard work. Yeah. Definitely. But people say property is not get rich quick. I say property is get rich quick. I, I think it's uh, like a rolling snowball down a hill. It just yeah. gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually you get to the point where you can... I want to get to the point where I'm doing sort of three or four deals a year rather than just having one deal that lasts four or five months. Yes, I'm with you. Um, I think if people put the right due diligence in, it's actually... you. It's possible to actually buy a property, renovate it, and refinance it and make 50 to 100 grand. You can do that. I've done it. I know it can be done. Well, that's what I'm, I'm hoping for on this one. So tell me about this project you keep doing at the moment. So bought it back probably, well, we've only had it six weeks. Wow, okay. We've only had it six weeks and we've ripped the entire place out. We've gone back to Britain. So you say we, who's we? So it's me and my dad. Me and my dad, basically. Okay, so dad's in. Is dad being paid? (laughs) Not not yet. Okay, all right, okay. I want to pay for my mum and dad to go away on holiday at the end of it. Okay, that's nice. A lot of of their helps kind of just labour jobs that don't require skill like wallpaper stripping. Yeah. But between the two, I would say that is a skill in itself. But yeah, I mean, my mum makes it an art. She can just go through a room in like a couple of hours. Um, it's, it's crazy. But my dad's retired now, and I think it's nice having the time with him because yeah. a lot of so like when I was turned ten, I was straight in a boxing gym, and he became my coach. So I had him coaching for me, uh, coaching for me for close to maybe nine, ten years. And then obviously when I box in the Navy, it's a different coach. So I've lost that sort of time with my dad. Yes, of course. Especially with my mum, because she used to travel with us as mm. well, all these different places I've boxed. So it's nice to have that family dynamic again. Of course it is, yeah. Uh, so it's like the big team coming in. So I you've had it. the property for six weeks. Yeah. Where, what's the plan? What are you doing? What are the renovations? What's the, what is so your goal all, with this one? Pretty much all the first fixes are done. What was it? Was it a terrace? Was it a, an end uh, terrace? So it's two... Um, Two terraced houses. Next right door next, to each other? Next door to each other, yeah. which is ideal, really. Uh, we've we've just started uh, the roof. The roof's pretty much done. Uh, that literally what was is, wrong with the roof? Uh, well. The, Old slate? Is it called? See, this is what I mean. I'm just learning the words now. So is it the, the, the membrane that goes underneath the loft? Yes. So usually on top of the rafters, you'll have a breathable membrane. Yeah. So we didn't have any of that. Yeah. So these older houses, I'm assuming it was slate. Uh, well, the old, the, the old roofs, you can see they built on top of the roofs with bricks. Okay. So towards the edges, the end caps of the houses, you can see where the brickwork's on top of the slate. Right, Which okay. is like, but, uh, so that's what we were pointing. But the, the roof's pretty much done. We've had new tiles in places. We have the, the new membrane. Uh, so you had to strip it all the way back, put a new membrane on, rebatten yeah. it, and then re-put yeah. the roof on. Did yeah. you reuse the slate that was there, or did you get new slate? Uh, well, I say I, I haven't done any of this. This is all the roofer, but he's he's used some of the old tiles. Great. Uh, and then, well, the, the front of the house we've kept the sort of the rugged look of the old tiles, and then yes. I'd, I'd report all the new ones on the back. Okay. So you can't really see, it, which is a nice little touch. I mean, yeah. Nobody else would probably look at it and go, "Oh, that's what they've done." No. But to me, I know, so it's it makes us sort of sleep at night. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. So, what was the cost to have a new roof done? Um, well, it was probably going to be close to four and a half. Four and a half grand. Which I think's a lot of money. But the, the initial... A lot of money, yeah. 
the initial court we had was 15,000, uh, 15, which wow. I think was just... And how much to pay for the house? 50. So 33 well, I was percent of the value of the property for just the roof. Well, it's probably wow. seven and a half per roof. Yeah, okay. Uh, I think that builder just didn't want the job, to be honest. No, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Which I can understand. Well, cause... I mean, when you take into account scaffolding, stripping it back, it's very labour intensive. I wouldn't say seven and a half is is massively over the top, given my experience of what I, mean, I know other people are charging. There's nothing close. Seven and a half grand is close to basically a new roof on each property anyways. And yeah. then after once the roof was off, <laughs> you can see... So basically those old houses have the old chimneys in them. Yes. Uh, but someone's blocked off the chimney, chimneys maybe about like 20 so years ago. So they've capped them at the top. They've capped them at the top, but they, someone was still having fires in there because you've no. got all the, um, is it soot? You've yeah. got all the soot in the loft. So you've got maybe about two or three inches of soot sort of on top of the loft insulation. And then when they haven't replaced the loft insulation, you've got it underneath as well. So I mean, my wow. dad spent close to two to three weeks just bagging all that up. We came out. <laughs> just... I bet you did, looking like you came out the coal mines. Yeah, so wow. that was that was a big job for us. And then when they also replaced the old roof, like, because that house is from maybe 1892, I think there's an order yeah. on it saying that I can't turn it into a pub or something like that. Okay, which yeah, is, yeah. Which is interesting. The joys of this old paperwork, yeah. Yeah, so uh, when they did the slate roof, they just chucked all the rubble on top of, on top of the roof. So we've emptied all that out, done all the loft, which is a horrible, horrible, horrible job. Yeah. So what about inside? What have you done inside to the property? So what's the internal plan? Internal plan, we've knocked out a lot of walls. Uh, so a lot of it's going to be lard and plaster? A lot of it is just plastering. Uh, the, the plastering's done, electrician's been in, done his first fixes, the plumber's been in. So rewire? Yeah, yeah. complete rewire. New plumbing as well? New plumbing. Okay. Uh, the, the back of the house uh, runs onto a garage and there's about a walkway that's just, it's tiny. It's all, no one can get access to it. It's all sort of okay. like blocked in. But the the concrete runs up maybe two foot against the wall, so you actually when you look out the back window, the concrete's almost there. So that's obviously absorbing all the water and yeah. going straight into our back. So we've got so somebody you need to coming put out. some drainage as well. So we've got someone coming out in a couple of weeks to dig all that up and then put the new drainage system in, which is just a job. That and how much is that going to cost? Well, we've been quoted fifteen hundred just to get rid of the concrete. Wow. Okay. But the drainage is relatively cheap. You can pick up a, a shallow drainage run for about nine to 10 pounds a meter. Yeah. So it's pretty cheap to actually buy. And then it's just installing the route and then making sure you've got your levels right so that the water drains away from the property and not close to. That's, that's the main that's, thing. That's the issue we have because for some reason where the water goes out of all this back street of the garage, the one place it runs is my house. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like I'm just... So you're just the pool. I'm just the pool at the moment. <laughs> okay. So that's, that's one of the big jobs to to sort and then like I said to you about the, our, our damp coursing earlier on a lot of a lot of the faults to our damp coursing wasn't yeah the our houses are old and there is a little bit of rise in damp but a lot of the issues of our damp is just hasn't been lived in for the past five yeah. six years well most houses will have rising damp they yeah. don't have a damp proof course and I think a lot of people don't understand that especially up north as well these older houses built in between 18 19 1920 they don't have a damp course so you know what did you do to solve your issue with the damp course well, a lot of the the damp we had was from when someone broke into the house maybe four or five years ago, ripped out the plumbing and didn't have like the decency to turn the water off. So we <laughs> How long had... was that there for? How long was the water gushing well, in? We know it was at least a year because uh, when I got on the phone to Northumbrian Water Board, they're like, what's happened to all the water? <laughs> what have you been using so much? And then I obviously wow. told them. Yeah. Uh, and they're like, yeah, that's fine. Just because I, I told them we're doing works and stuff. They said, don't worry about your water bill, but- Well, that was for, nice, yeah. Th thanks for letting us know. Yeah. And literally the same guys have just literally done it next door as well, because that's a basically a vacant property now. So are these properties on a street that's all boarded up? Is it a nice street? Is it's, it a bad it's a, street? It's a really nice street. They're just okay. the one bad part of the whole street is the block I own. So you bought the ugliest and the worst house on the best street? Pretty, North Road Darlington is, I, I like to call it the prime real estate of Darlow, just because okay. it's the most, it's it's the road that gets you to Teesside, it's the road that gets you to sort of where I live, Acliff, which is quite big with Hitachi, Gestamp, all yes. the places. It gets and there's a lot coming to Darlington as well. Yep, yeah, and it's the main road to Darlington train station, and it's just like, if you wanted a house in Darlington that I could either turn into service accommodation, HMO, or rent out, yeah, that's, in my eyes, where would you want it to be? And it's on the front as well. The only downside is there's not much parking, but... To be honest with you, everybody parks around the corner 
up the side street or on the opposite side of the road. Yeah. So it's ideal. So buying the house for 50 grand. Yep. What's the renovation costs? Well. What's your expected? Expected is probably close to 50. 50 for the refurb? Wow. Yep. Okay. Um, and what's the end? So what's the property going to be at the end? Well, the, the value that came out said <coughs> the, the worst we can get valued is 190. 190. Yep. Right, okay. And so is the 50 grand, is that for all, is that for both properties? Or is that for both, both okay. properties. That's... So you bought the first one for 50, how much to buy the second one for? 50. Okay, so 100 grand, yep. 50 on it, yep. so there's 150 in, plus legals, expenses. Yeah, it takes me about one, 160. Okay, and then they reckon the worst, so the GDV, which is the gross development yep. value of that project at the end, the worst come, outcome is going to be 190. Yeah. And was that based on getting a bridging loan and them giving you a GDV? Yeah. Right, okay. So the the thing is, those those flats were initially planned at one bedroom, really small flats. Yeah. Now we've knocked out walls, proper open planned it, we've turned the upstairs into two beds. So each property is going to be turned into two flats. So that's yep. four flats over two houses. Yep. So how has that worked with building control? Have you had to get building control in? Uh, no. Like I said to you before, the, the vo someone who, uh, just before we bought them, they already did all that paperwork. Okay. So they've already been listed as two flats. Even even the meters, the electrical meters outside the, the house were in yeah. two flats. So what about the ceilings? So have you soundproofed the ceilings? Are you fireboarding them? Uh, so they, are most... getting, they are getting fireboarded. Uh, right. The soundproofing, I'm not too sure yet on, to be honest. We've still got in talks with our builder about different things because the, the fire doors and we're getting the, the house inspector out, I believe, or having a chat with him. So uh, most commonly what you'll need to do is you'll need to get a, a sound test. Yep. So you need to get a test to ensure that the sound that travels from downstairs to upstairs is adequate enough and passes today's standards. So realistically, what I do, not everybody, is you would have to, most commonly most people get someone to come out and plan this for them because every property is different. But I would always insulate in between the joists. Then below I would do a sub ceiling. The sub ceiling I would have usually like a metal frame and I put like little rubber dongs on so it stops the sound vibration traveling up. Um, so I would usually insulate in between the rafters or the joists. Uh, then I would fireboard it. Then I would drop the ceiling. Then I would insulate with a sound uh, insulation. So 100 mil sound slabs in there. And then I would double fireboard underneath. So it's a little bit of overkill, but that's usually what I do as a standard. And it protects from fire, protects from sound, and just makes it a, a nice solid um, a ceiling and a nice solid structure. But everybody's different. Yeah. Um, but that's what I usually have done that complies with building control on most times when I'm converting buildings into flats. That's, that's the thing, I'm, I'm slowly going through this process of all the, the fire regulations because I, I got told they just changed again. Uh, they're, they're well, I say, changing, I say yeah. again, that was like two months ago where all the major changes for like the HMOs. And I think like the biggest problem is in, to, in what you're doing is the mistakes are costly. Yeah. So if you're doing this and then building control comes to actually know you need to have, the, have it this way, which they should tell you prior anyway, yeah. then all of a sudden you've either got to rip the ceiling down, you've got to re-insulate it, you've got to reboard it. And that's not only expensive in materials, but very expensive in labor. Um, luckily, you can do that, you know, and you've got your dad and your mum, but a lot of people might not have that. Yeah. And I most definitely have made those mistakes several times and learned very heavily from that in the past. Um, so what's the plan when it finishes? Are you going to Airbnb? Are you going to rent it out privately? What's so the plan? This is the issue I have with my uh, my mortgage agreement for, oh, I'm not too sure what the technical term is, but they basically flip me from the bridge in straight into uh, the, the buy-to-let mortgage. Okay, and that's with Shawbrook? Shawbrook, yeah. Okay, great product, so they'll basics. Okay, so that's quite common now. So you'll buy the property on a bridge, yep. you'll renovate it, they'll usually give you those funds up front, so that'll boost up your LTV, which is your loan to value. And then from there, you'll go from the, the GDV, so it'll either be from the GDV or a new valuation, and you'll basically refinance it and go onto a long-term product. So is that gonna be on a two-year fixed rate, five-year fixed rate, do you know yet? I, I, I don't know yet, Haven't, okay. I just, I'd leave that with, with my the broker. mortgage broker. Yeah, okay, yeah. Cool. I, he, he always does look after us. Yeah. Um, and but, just for people watching this, what's usually the fees involved in bridging? What have you experienced so far? So you have to you have to pay to set up the bridge. Yeah. Then you have to also pay for the bridge, and then also you've got to pay for the actual end application for when you transfer it over into a. a the buy to let mortgage. Did you have dual representation as well, solicitors? So you got uh, multiple solicitors fees? Um, well, that's the thing. I, I've been told I don't have to pay solicitors to transfer it over from bridging to a buy to let mortgage. No, so you shouldn't have to do that. But initially, to actually buy the property, you might have had to have dual representation. Um, I, did, I did only have one set of legal fees. 
Okay. Um, they were a bit expensive though, so that's probably why. Is it because they were Shawbrooks? No, no, no. no they, were they yours? I've, I've bounced around a fair few solicitors now. I'm okay. Keep, I'm, it's, it's hard because the reality is they the big firms don't really care about a, I a small I feel you property. a bit on that, yeah. yeah. So it's just kind of like, oh, when there's a bit of free time, we'll sort that out. And yeah. Sadly, a lot of the firms around here are exactly the same. Um, but it just is what it is. It just takes time. You find the right conveyancer. It takes yeah, time. Yeah, so the, the one yeah. I've just had, we... We had a, it was a bit of a pain to, to get the ball rolling on the actual deal because the sale, sale was agreed on. We started moving solicitors and we were just waiting on theirs for just months. Okay. And then when all the balls the ball started rolling, it took about maybe a month, a month and a half yeah. for it to go through. Yeah, bridging is relatively simpler compared to a buy to let mortgage. Yep. Yeah. So when the property, so the idea is that you're going to go onto a product where you're going to rent the property out. Yeah. Okay. And what do you think you can achieve rental wise on each flat, which would be a one bed I assume? Minimum. Minimum 550. 550. I could get 600 maybe for the two beds. Okay. Um, which, so is it so is it two one beds, two two beds? Well, it was initially four one beds, but the upstairs are now two beds because we're basically making the bathroom smaller and you can fit easily a nice, like, well, it's bigger than my old okay. bedroom. Um, so you've got 1,200 on the two two beds and then 550. So that's a good rental income. And what's your mortgage going to be? Do you have an idea? Uh, I think it is... Um, do you know what it's going to be when it's complete? It's 255 per flat. So that works out close to a grand, really. Okay, so we should be talking maybe a thousand pound profit here. Yeah. Okay, that sounds good. What do you think you're going to do with that? Just rack it up. I want to buy next door as well. You want to buy next door? Okay. So, so what are you going to do with next door? Exactly the same. Exactly the same. Because uh, there's a garage on it as well. So I'm, I'm trying I'm trying my best to sweet talk who owns it. So just sell us the garage and the flats. But it's I think it's called a flying field. Yes. So the garage is underneath. And it runs all the way around the back, but above the garage is these flats. Um, they, they do have their own house as well, but above the garage it extends over into the four flats. So you've got one downstairs, three upstairs. So you're going to have, by the time, so when are you 23? March. So by 23, so still at 22, you're going to own six properties. You've got the first two that are cash flowing already. Yep. So you're going to be making approximately £2,000 net profit a month. Yep. At 22. And you still want to work? You still want to do a normal job? Well, it, it's hard because the Navy, I wouldn't class it as work. Okay. At the moment. At the moment, because I'm in what's called like phase two training, which is basically college. Okay. And so, is the Navy a long-term progressive career you want to do? No, no, no. Not at all. I'm literally just doing it because it is, at the moment, money for all growth. Um, okay. <laughs> um, and a lot of people will probably disagree with me on that because there's some people working some horrible hours. I've worked horrible hours when I was on board. Yeah. And I'm just back into the training cycle now and everybody knows that the training cycle is nice and easy. Like a lot of it's half days, a lot of it's sort of not coming in. The main reason I'm here is because I just asked my boss if I could go home for two weeks to do some work. And he was like, yeah, that's fine. All oh, right, so easy peasy then. Would you say the Navy's very easy as a job? No. Okay. No, a lot of people don't realize this. Everybody thinks the military is this kind of like this really nice happy place and it is to be fair a lot of it can be especially with the boxing uh, I've been to Barbados Portugal. tell me about the boxing so you've been boxing since you're a young lad your dad yeah. trained you up what got you into boxing well I was, I was playing really good at football to be fair I was playing football for Darlington uh, town team when I was like 15 16 uh, we, we were first in Newcastle all the rest of it and I just wanted to be fitter and like stronger and boxing was the easiest thing my dad did a bit of boxing when he was in the army as well yeah. And then went straight from there. Sort of turns out I enjoyed boxing more than football. Canned box, uh, canned football. Went straight into boxing. Then I've won a couple of national titles, box for England, wow. uh, box for box for Navy a good few times. And had some. I'm just I'm blown away by the fact that you're boxing. You're in the Navy. You're you're learning to build. Yeah. You're dealing with tenants. Where is this drive coming from? At such a young age as well. And I'm not trying to be. Um, you know, I'm not trying to sit here and say, oh, you're only 22, you should be out partying, because I was the same. You know, yeah. I was working crazy hours at 22 and building businesses, but I know where my drive comes from. Yeah. Where's your drive come from? I, I just, I, I don't know. It's just always the same. I used to have a job at Tesco's, and there used to be a guy called, uh, Kai, uh, Jesus, a guy who worked there called Cliff, and he's been at Tesco's for like 20 odd years. And I started that job when I was like 17. I was like, I just don't want to be ordinary. I've, and it's not like some kind of ego thing. I just, I wanted to do something different. Uh, my mum and dad have both had, like, they've been partying as well. They've been all over. Yeah. They've had good jobs. My dad's retired now. And it's not that 
I don't like that lifestyle. I just want something different. What's the drive for you? Is it money? Is it career progression? I just Is want to it work having stuff? I just want to work for myself. So the, maybe freedom? The, the, the freedom with the Navy, I, I do have at the moment. But the reality is, when you go away for those four or five months, you just have someone telling you what to do. And yeah. I, it's not that I don't like that. It's not like a power complex. It's just I, I want to work for me. Like, it's not even that I'm lazy. It's just I'll be at the house for like 15 hour days if, if my dad let us. But my dad's like, oh, yeah, we have to go now. We need to get some food. You haven't had anything to eat. That's uh, good. I think it's a good thing if you've got that work ethic to do it and to work hard like and to I, I drive do, and to push yourself. I do work hard for myself. Yeah. Like, I didn't realise how much I can actually graft. Like, I, I thought I was like, oh, yeah, I'm just... The thing is, when it's yours yeah. and, you know, you're doing this for you, I think it's different. You know, if you're working for somebody else and you're building and you're earning, let's say, 150 or 200 pounds a day, you're just slugging away, you're doing a job. Yeah. Right? When it's your house, it's your passion, you're emotionally invested into this, you've put all this time and effort into this, it's yours, you are going to make it work, you're going to, you know, you're going to work hard. And I think that's the best thing about properties, if you can physically able, you know, if you're able to put your hands in and do the manual labour, it's, it's a labour of love. Well, that's me. <laughs> Even no, in I'm... the worst properties full of soot in the loft, it's a labour of love, because you're smiling. And it's, it's enjoyable. I still love it, even today. I love getting my hands dirty. After this podcast, I'm going to do a site visit. I'm going to get on site and probably fit a kitchen today. Yeah. I just love it. I can't help myself. I don't need to fit a kitchen. I've got people to fit in the kitchens for me. I just really enjoy it. That's our next next lesson that me and my dad are going to teach ourselves. Kitchens. Yeah, we, he's just bought this. He's always buying himself stuff. And I said, whatever you buy, I'll just... Oh, I'll the just tools, the toys. Yeah, yeah. So okay. you just buy all the tools and your stuff you want and I'll just fund it because I said you'll probably be using them as, before me anyway. Where are you getting your kitchens from? Howden's. Okay, Howden's pretty good, yeah. We we still get our kitchens from Howden's, yeah. There's one, I did make a bit of a mess up though. What ordered, was the mess up? I ordered the kitchens probably about three months too early. Okay. So I've got right. four, four kitchens in one of my... Just sat there? Just sat there, so we've got... Obviously so before four. you even really built it, so it wasn't perfectly planned, it wasn't measured accurately as to where oh, no, it was? No, no, so the, the, the kitchens themselves have all been measured up and planned and ordered and we know which, like, sort of the... The kitchens in the back rooms are for upstairs. The kitchens in the front room are for downstairs. Can I guess the kitchens you bought? Probably is it a Greenwich sandstone or a Greenwich navy? Uh, sandstone. Yeah, so it's Greenwich. Yeah. I thought it might be. I mean, everybody. <laughs> How did we know? <laughs> everybody from Howden's as a property developer just knows that range. Yeah. It's either Greenwich sandstone, navy, or, or even the jasmine colour green. Like So me and my dad, we don't... We're not like... My dad did his level one bricklaying course when he left the army, along with his uh, a basic construction course. We have yeah. like basic knowledge, but he's like... He's so if you're in the services, there's a lot of advantages here. So you get all this additional training, all this additional help to try and help you get onto the housing ladder. I'm surprised more people aren't going it's, into the, the services, so like the Navy or the armed forces. It's it's kind of not sold, like, it's not sold properly. Okay. So it's it's like, oh, we can, we can buy your house, but you have to be in for 10 years. They don't really push the fact that you can pay it off any time. Right. So we have this thing in the Navy called like the BR, and I'm an absolute nerd for it, to be honest. I'm a nerd anyways, but I'm a proper... This is like all your legislation for being in the Navy and what you're entitled to, what you can get out of the Navy. And I get every single penny I can. <laughs> I okay. Give everything I can claim for, every mileage, every food, every receipt. And it is, it's a bit horrible because I'm always allowed to put the claims in. But No, that's sensible. That's smart. But it's there for a reason, right? Yeah. So yeah. there's a lot You're not of, taking the Mickey. There's a lot of especially the younger lads joining, like the 18, 19 year olds, they don't know this. And to be fair, the Navy doesn't really tell them. Yeah. So going forward, you told me you still want to go into property. What's the plan from now until you're 24? So how how are you gonna get into more property? What's the plan? So basically after this deal's done, hopefully Feb, the remortgage is all done, I'll get all that money back out. It's basically go next door or go into something sort of commercial. Okay, I like commercial. What are your thoughts on commercial? Because I think this is downplayed a lot by people. They don't realize why commercial is such a good investment. Well, it's essentially all the rental, but no work. That's, <laughs> that's something like that, yeah. It's, you so get all an the... FRI lease, which is the main one, yeah. which is a fully repairing and insuring lease. The thing I love about those is the tenant goes into the commercial property as a set standard, and it's in, they're in charge of paying the insurance, or the contribution towards. 
They're in charge of keeping the maintenance, the repairs for the building. You can actually really screw over a commercial tenant. That's what I don't like about commercials because people don't realize how much of an obligation it is that you have to take care of that building. And I've had it before, I've rented out commercial premises actually in Winslow and Buckinghamshire. And the landlord, if he watches this, completely screwed me over where I was young, naive, I didn't read the lease properly and the solicitors didn't really advise me at the time. And I rented out this building and when I came to giving it back after, I think it was six years, I meticulously, on my hands and knees, scrubbed everything. I put new flooring in, I made it look great. And he just walked in and went, no, this isn't good enough, not happy with it. Absolutely full of, you know, dog, basically. And he knew what he was doing. He just knew he'd get me over a barrel. And he was like, well, I'll get someone in to come and inspect all the work. And at the time I was like, you know what, whatever, just keep the deposit then. And I just didn't read into it well enough. So I think commercial can be a um, great investment for landlords. But if you're a commercial tenant, I think it could, you know, yeah. unless you research, there's a lot of pitfalls in this, a lot of pitfalls. But the good thing is, and the advantage in my opinion with a commercial building is, it's very easy to get the tenant out in relation to a residential. So the rules in, in residential and commercial are completely different. The only difference I found, tell me if you agree or disagree, the value of commercial and residential, residential's here, over 10 years, commercial's maybe here. It doesn't go up at the same rate. The rent's great, the yield's great, but the value of the, the capital appreciation is not as great. Yeah, 100% because it's, well, it depends what state they left, leave it in. Yes. Because that's gonna, obviously, if they leave it with signs hanging off like the garage next door to us is, then that makes your whole property just, well, look look horrible. Yes, well it depends what's in the lease, because realistically, most leases, they've got to provide it back in the same condition, yeah. or maintain it in the same condition it was provided to them. So most of the time they Does that should- really happen? Well, you've got a deposit, so I yeah. suppose with a deposit, you know, you could take it from there. Yeah. And usually a commercial deposit is between three months for a relatively um, well-established company and six months for a newish limited company. Um, and hey, if it's in their personal name, then it's really easy to get the money back because yeah. they've got assets. It's easy to take them to court and, and get that financing back. Um, for me, I've done a lot of commercial investing where I've invested. So actually yesterday I, I struck a deal. Hopefully um, this podcast goes out after everything's been signed. But I struck a deal to buy 4,000 square feet of commercial building for £110,000. It's bringing in 17500 per year, guaranteed for the next five years. And it goes up every year at the rate of RPI, which means I'm making a really nice profit on that building. So how, do you, how do you find stuff like that? Because my way of finding stuff is basically... I found these flats was basically just seen a to let sign ringing up the estate agents and yep. said, look, at, do they want to sell that or have they got any other properties to sell? That was my very basic. So that's how I started. And yeah. then I built a network. So from Birmingham to uh, the Northeast, to the Northwest, I've got estate agents everywhere that I've worked before and they know the level of, the, they know the way I work. They know that I'm honest, straight to the point. And if I say I'll buy it, I'll buy it. There's no messing around. So a lot of the time, the way I get my property now is I get a call from someone or a connection of a connection and they'll say, hey, Jamie, um, so same for a hotel, but I'll tell you about that in a minute. So they'll say, hey, Jamie, we've got this property coming on the market. It's not advertised yet. Here's the price. Here's the rental income. What do you think? I say, send me a video. Let me go and see it. And I'll literally tell them straight away, yeah, I'll buy it. No problem at all. Here's your proof of funds. Here's the legals. Let's get it through. And they're like, great, working with Jamie's easy, we get it sold. You know, it's a really quick and easy yeah. process. Or for a lot of those properties, I might go to a few of my clients and say, hey, We've got this property, here's the package for it, here's the rental income, here's the yield, um, here's my thoughts on the property, is it one of interest to you? Because I can't buy everything. Yeah. And uh, that's kind of how we source a lot of our property at your home group as well. So it's all off an agreement with, that we have with a lot of people. I have a lot of people that sell property privately. So because we've got the construction firm, when we're doing renovations on a property, you'd be amazed the amount of people that will come to you and say, oh, hey, I, I saw you were renovating the property. Do you know who the owner is? And I'll, if it's someone on the side, they say, oh yeah, it's Jamie. And they go, well, I'm thinking of selling my house or you know, I, I wanna maybe renovate my, or maybe I wanna sell it, I'm not sure. And you're like, well, let's go and have a look. I've probably bought 10, 10 properties in the last few years just from that, where they're like, I just wanna sell it, I don't wanna do the renovations, you know, are you interested in buying it? Because they know the house needs work doing to it. I'll go in, I'll usually get it below market value because they get to save money on fees and time. And, and that's how I'll get that. But example, I had a call the, the, a few months ago now, 
and they said, hey, Jamie, um, so we've got something that might be of interest. So we know you're building your first hotel and it's not finished yet, but how would you like a second hotel? I don't know how you do it. And in my head, I'm like, yeah, I don't know how I'm going to explain that one to my partner. <laughs> so I bought this first one. I'm working 18 hours a day, but yeah, let's take a second one. He said, look, it's a huge hotel. Um, it's got, you know, all these, it's got planning on it to knock it down and turn it into two blocks of flats for assisted living. And I thought to myself, okay, let's look at the demographics on the area. So I've done all my due diligence. I've realized they're opening a whole new factory literally around the corner and it's going to have thousands of new workers. So I'm like, okay, let's see what I can get it for. So I bought this huge hotel with a pub restaurant attached to it and a huge plot of land and a tarmac car park with a brand new roof on it for 75 and a half grand, which is insane. It's so cheap. And the plan is it's going to cost me 220 grand to completely refurbish it, turn it into a huge apart hotel with a bar restaurant next to it and then have a convenience store next to that. So my total outlay is going to be, including legals, fees, probably around 310 in total. How do you organise stuff like that with regards to like sort of getting, I imagine it'll be your construction company getting yes. involved. Yeah. But for someone like me who doesn't have that construction company. So that... do you know what it comes down to experience? Yeah. So for me, I've done quite a lot of commercial to residential conversions. I've done so, I've done, I would probably say my fair share of 50 maybe plus of quite large renovations in the last five years alone. So I, in my head, I'm really good at doing this. Um, I'm able to visualize everything. It's like, um, so I've never actually announced this before. So I've got ADHD and the amazing thing with ADHD is it allows me to have uh, a million things exploding in my mind. So I can walk into a building and I can visualize what it will look like after the renovation. I can also calculate at the same time the exact cost of everything it's gonna to cost to renovate it. And at the same time, I know the pitfalls, what this is gonna cost me, and I can structure and routine immediately who I need to contact, how I need to contact, the timescales for them to, from contacting them to get it done. So it's, it's a superpower. My ADHD is a superpower, and that's the only reason I've got to where I am today, is it's allowed me to explode with my creativity and what I wanna do. It hasn't always worked to my advantage because uh, when I was younger, I used to be very spontaneous and I used to just be impulsive with everything. So I would just buy things, I'd renovate things, I'd take on all these huge project renovations and I'd be like, on my own, I am my own building team. Yeah. I've got six properties to build. I've got five houses to do tenant maintenance. I'm like, what am I doing? Like, I can't manage all this. And then another deal comes up. I'm like, yeah, I'll take that one as well. <laughs> I'm like, Jamie, you need to learn to slow down and stop. You can't do everything. Yeah. But in my mind, that particular deal, the hotel, immediately I thought, okay, I think it might go for a lot more. He said, Jamie, look, if you want it, here's what I think you can pay for it. I put in 20 grand less than what he thought I could pay for it, accepted, got the deal. And that was through a bank, so the bank owned it, it was repossessed. A year before that, it sold for 240,000 pound, the same plot without a new roof. So in my opinion, I've now got a property for 150 grand less than it was paid for realistically, you know, a, a year ago. And I've got the advantage that it's got a huge roof on this commercial premises and a pub restaurant, which is brand new um, slate. So it's very expensive. So it's got to be at least 30 grand worth of roofing on it. So I've gone into the building and I just have, when I see properties that I want, I have, do you have that in your gut? Where your gut goes. It's like, you know, when you first, like, it, when, you know, when you first kissed your first like partner when you were like a kid, right? And you're like, oh, that was really exciting. I walk into a property and I'm like, Oh, this is really exciting. Yeah, I really want I'm this exactly property. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, this is going to be my property. Like, it's going to happen. And I walk in and I can visualize the fire. It's, 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 maybe it makes me sound mental. I don't know. I always thought I had, I was normal and everybody else had a screw loose. Like, everybody else was just wired wrong and I was the only normal person. Now I've come to realize that everybody else is wired normally and I have the screw loose I'm and I'm wired that, differently. I'm still in that phase of everybody's a screw loose. Yeah. <laughs> You'll realize that it's actually you that's the crazy yeah. one because, you know, normal people will work nine to five. They'll have respectable jobs. They'll buy a house, get married, have maybe a few children. Very the old way of doing it, should we say, maybe nowadays. Oh. Whereas people like us, you know, who at 22 do you know own six properties? I mean, who, who so does this is, this is the thing. People, like, I, I wouldn't say I'm a relatively clever person about all this property. I just have good people around us and doing it. But when people come to me, like, how, how have you bought all these? And I think to myself, I mean, I don't think I've done like that. But much. have you gone out every weekend doing drugs and drink? No, but no, like, I, I mean, but thing, even even still, though, like like 
people who go out drinking and stuff like that, it's not that I have anything against it, it's just not me. No, I agree. I've, I'm the my, same. I've always, my head's always either been in the gym or yeah. in the books. Yeah, um, I totally understand. Well, to be fair, probably not too much in the books, but definitely in the gym. That was my life from 10 till, what, 16. Yeah. And then it kind of fizzled out between 17 and 18. And when I've joined the Navy, the boxing started just picking up again. I think when people are working 37 and a half to 40 hours a week, I will do that in a few days. You know, and, and so will you by the sound yeah. of it. So, you know, Monday to Wednesday. So, for example, Monday just gone, I started at 3.30 in the morning. I left my house, That's drove all the way here. It's just, you get used to it. Uh, and i got kids as well, so you get used to it. Jeez. And, uh, you know, I didn't finish work till one in the morning. So, you know, that, that is a long, that's 20 plus hours a day. You know, if I've done that in three days, don't get me wrong, it mentally and physically does not do you any good. And I'm not suggesting anybody does it. But in already in three days, so now on Wednesday, I'll be doing the same today because I've got so much to finish. I would have already done, you know, 60 hours in three days. I've already done a third more than most people will do in the rest of the seven days. Well, uh, the, we had the house for less than two days and this house was filled with stuff as well. It was filled with old furniture, old bathrooms, kitchens, walls. Within three days, we had all the kitchens out, all the old stuff out, all the walls I out. I love it, yeah. And, and most people wouldn't even comprehend how you could do that well, in three we didn't days. Even, we didn't even get a skip. We've literally <laughs> just filled up my car. So my little what Ford, car have you got? Ford, Ford Focus ST line yep, outside. Is just ST cool. line, you added that bit in. It's not just any Ford Focus, it's an ST line. Okay. Well, it's, I always say ST and then go line. <laughs> okay. But yeah, we've just been filling that up. So literally the, the first day we had, had the house, we had maybe 12, 14 skip runs. I had a couple of my friends wow. come help us fill up the car. Yeah. And that's actually just them them stood at the door just chucking me stuff. It was just kind of some conveyor belt and we just fill in the skip up. I mean The thing to... I love about talking to you is I feel like it's me ten years ago. It nearly is actually. But I, I, I love the fact that you're on this journey and you're gonna learn so much and there there will of course be pitfalls and there's so much I've still got to learn. Every day is still a learning day for me, you know. Um, and there's so much you're gonna learn. It's this it's such a joyous path. And you clearly love property as much as I do. So when you've got the sixth property, what point do you think, is there a retirement point? Is there an end goal? How, is the, how are you structuring this or are you just winging it? Uh, I'd say I'm definitely winging it, but I mean, I've always had a plan of what I want to do with myself from like maybe 12 years old. Okay. I, 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 I was selling sweets at school, but before I was selling Snap, sweets, so was I. Okay, how did you sell sweets at school? Like four for a pound, 50p. <laughs> that, that, Where were the sweets from? Who's your stockist? Um, everywhere to be fair. I literally, it started off with basically getting, we had some, some talk at school and some lady was giving out free sweets. I was like, sod that, I just basically took the whole basket and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I think the best entrepreneurs sell sweets at school. Um, it's either that or cigarettes, but, but, but we never condone selling cigarettes at school. Before that, it was like Halloween. So I used to get the sweets and my dad used to buy them off us just... I mean, it was only like, what, a couple of pieces sweet, but you always just, you just, I don't know, maybe just him encouraging it. Yeah. But it's, that's probably where it started from, all this drive. But from when I was like 15, 16, I, I planned I wanted to do property. From property, I wanted to sort of work for myself. And then from working for myself, I just wanted to be semi-retired. Uh, I'm in talks now at the moment to set up my own uh, tenancy agency, mainly because okay. the, the broker I use, he wants, he wants to set up his own tenancy agency as well. So I was like, oh, well, why don't we just do it together? And okay. that's just a second avenue stream. I yeah. mean, I don't want it to be my main priority, but I can basically set it up, get it started running, and then just get someone in. Are you going to carry on investing in Darlington? Yeah. Okay. That's my spot because, I mean, it'd be nice to invest in Middlesbrough, but with the amount of journeys we're coming to and from, it just it's nice to have something local, maybe in the future. Would you invest in Middlesbrough? It's a, it's a very difficult area to invest in because I think if, unless you're from Middlesbrough... There are some areas that are nice and some areas that are not so nice. So it's very hard, hard to di differentiate. Yeah. I, I, I don't know Middlesbrough. I know Darlow. Yeah. So it's always good to stick in the areas you know. Yeah. I think that's important, especially when you're starting off as well. What advice would you give to anybody who's starting off in property and wants to get into property at whatever age they are? I think just be patient. That's the one bit. If I probably waited a little bit longer, I could have been a bit quicker with how I'd done stuff because I've just kind of plunged in this head first. And a lot of people, oh yeah, I want to buy a house. But the reality is they haven't done any due, gil uh, due gil diligence or yes. anything anything towards that. And I mean, there's there's people who happily spend 200 quid on Palm Angel t-shirts. I mean, it's not a lot of money, but 
it does add up. What's a two hundred? What's a Palm Angel T-shirt? <laughs> that's that's what everybody's wearing at the moment. That's like right. Okay, you can see I'm fashionable in my Tesco hoodie. So. <laughs> I mean, my mum bought this. Yeah. See, this uh, is the other thing as well. Is it doesn't matter how much money you've got in the bank or how many assets you own. I've got nothing. You got no. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Because it's but, all out on property. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so that's what yeah. I mean. I'm, I'm all in on this yeah. deal at the moment. It's it's either. So make you're up. playing with huge risks. Yeah. Huge risks. So, I mean, worst comes to worst, I just sell them. Yeah. Uh, that's. That's like scraping the barrel. But I mean, definitely for someone my age, it's just save up that money. It's slow, painful times, boring. You see, like I see a lot of my mates I went to school with, they all going out on holidays. Yeah. And I'm just like looking on my phone at the house after I've just been slugging out for a couple of hours, relaxed, going on my Instagram reels and just seeing people like just living it up large. I mean, it's it's not the What you see thing. on Instagram is not a reality though. Oh yeah, 100%. It's people's best version of themselves. But, or their inflated version. It's not it's not true. Yeah, so but it's it's still like that could be my other life. I always like to say this. there's always like two balances. It's either like you always make more money or you can make more. Do time. you want that? Is yeah. that the life you want? No. I it's just I d like so my the big thing in my head's always like life choices. Like I never know if I'm making the right decision. I always just go for it. If, if my gut feels it, I just go for it 100%. But I still always question it. So I, I don't know if 22-year-old, I should be enjoying myself. I should I mean, I'm, I won't be partying or anything. I haven't. Like, I didn't. But I'd, so. I'd like to go definitely on a lot more holidays with me, me missus. I think the thing that it gives you is time. Yeah. So right now, if I wanted to, to a point, I could just hop onto a plane and go and fly. I don't know, I could go fly to Dubai. Yeah. And I could take my partner and our children out there and we can go spend two weeks out there. Now, I shouldn't really do that because I've got quite a lot to do here and I've got a yeah. lot of you know stuff to do with work, but I have the freedom of time. And although, <clears throat> yes, I probably have the, the better financials than, than maybe some others, I can just, I have that time to go and do that. You know, if I want to go home and go and spend time with my son today because he's not feeling very well, I can go and do that. You know, whereas people are in a nine to five, they're stuck, they can't do that, they don't have the... They they feel they don't have the choice. They do, but they feel stuck in that trap. You yeah. know, they have to. And I think it's so hard to get out of that trap. Well, that's that's what I mean. So a lot of people in the Navy are stuck in that trap. A lot of people sort of, who have the kids and built their family around the Navy, they can never yeah. leave. Because the yeah. Navy, the Navy, uh, the Navy pay you a lot of things like get your home pay and stuff like that. And you get learning credits and stuff. And a lot of people are trapped into that lifestyle that cycle that cycle because they they don't have enough savings because they spent a lot of their money getting home like i spent yeah. close to 300 pounds to get home on a month i'm either paying money on fuel to get home do they not reimburse you for that you, you when you're attached to a ship you get uh travel warrants which okay. i think it's like 10 a year but realistically everybody's going to go home more than 10 times a year especially yeah. if i've got family up north and i'm in portsmouth yes that's a long uh, drive yeah, it's about yeah. seven or eight hours. That's a long drive, yeah. yeah. What would you say is your biggest learning lesson? What's the biggest thing you've learned since starting in property? How a deal actually works. Is it as easy as you first thought it no. was? No. <clears throat> like I said, my, my only transactions with people is me pulling a suite out of my bag, giving it yeah. to someone, then giving me the money back. I never realised how far the process goes, especially when I bought a house for myself. It was a lot slower than buying it through the property. Uh, would you recommend? <clears throat> would you recommend people pay for training courses? No, okay. I think because you I, partially went to I, one. I, so. I did go for a training course, and I feel like there's a lot of people blowing smoke up each other's. Mm -hmm. um, and I we won't like, name names, but there's quite a few out there industry leaders that I will always say make more money from training courses than do from property. And there's a reason for that. I my I mean I said this on my the one I did the other day but my big belief is bringing everybody up with you I'd, I'd always have time for my friends to help them out or point them in the right direction tell them stuff I learned I mean I don't know everything but I can always save them the pitfalls I've done so do you feel like you've lost friends because of what you're doing that's the thing though I've never had like tons of friends the friends I've I've only had a close group maybe three or four friends that I'd proper call for everybody has tons of mates yeah but I've three or four friends that I'll stick with and they've sort of stayed with us like they haven't ran off or anything and that's like class I, I don't see how people like like I said to you earlier I don't I, I feel everybody's weird <laughs> like that's I'm with uh, you on that yeah. every, everyone thinks I'm weird but I'm just like well you're weird and it's just like we're all stood there just pointing at each other in different circles and yeah yeah um but I, I definitely I definitely so grateful for everyone around us if you can go back what would you change or would you change anything at all? I wouldn't change anything. It's all kind of stumbled itself together. It's just kind of like 
someone getting in late from the night out and you're just you're stumbling in and you, you're slowly finding your way up the stairs. And that's how my journey in property be. I've just been stumbling my way through. I think that's an important thing is realistically, you just winged it. And I winged it. And most people wing it. And I think so many people maybe that are watching this think that if you're going to be really good at property or you're going to be great at anything at all, even selling sweets, you've got to wing it. You know, it just, it cut, you learn, but you should wing it. You know, like, it's you, of, of course, try and plan to the best of your ability, but the majority of things happen from just like the, winging it and just the, doing your best. The best it a go. lesson I, I probably learned was probably selling sweets. That walking up to people, oh, do you want to buy some sweets? And then initially... I mean, you couldn't do that now as an adult, but... Yeah, yeah. initially it snowballed. <laughs> Not to school kids, yeah. It snowballed into the point I had everybody coming to me. Yeah. It's that slow process of just walking around. You built around. that customer relation. And then I was, I was having maybe like 20, 30 quid a day, just which doesn't sound a lot, but in 50 P's and pound coins, it, it weighs a ton. Yeah. Especially in the bag and you're walking around and you're ka ching just ching 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 Yeah, yeah. But that's, that's the sound of money, that's what I we used, liked. I used to just get on the bus and I'd have everybody on the bus pretty much buy sweets from us. Then every, school lunch breaks, I'd just go to the same spot and then everybody would just come to us. And then even at one point we did a, uh, the school that has set up a, a, a bake stall yeah, it was it was for some kind of um, some lad was running running for charity or something like that. So I, I set up my sweets on the end. I mean, it's not really the mor- the moral thing to do, but I just set up. I pulled a, a chair and a, a table from outside the classroom and just set up down from the the stall. So I wasn't part of the charity event, but I was just kind of just blagging me on little sweet stall. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> everybody brought money in. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. So, I mean, I, I did feel a bit bad, so I chucked about 20 quid in the titty, but I literally had all five years of the school buying sweets. I had, I had three bags that day just packed with, if I got caught, God knows what would have happened, but my locker was full, and I, I parked my um, my table and chair just right outside my locker as well, so I had, like, coke cans and all sorts. It was like, but all businesses are a risk, right? Yeah. That's the fun of doing it. That's the enjoyment. I have to ask, is there anybody that you would take inspiration from? Is there anyone that's been an inspiration to you on your journey, entrepreneurial, through property at all? There's, uh, there's a, a speech by <clears> some, <throat> uh Who's the guy that goes, all right, all right, all right? The, uh, the American. Um, I have no idea. <laughs> but there's, he, he, he won a Grammy, and he's like, oh, the, the, like his inspiration is himself in like 10 years' time. Okay. And that's always been me. Like, I've always thought to myself, right, you do I want to be in 10 years' time. Right, what's he doing? And that's always been my inspiration. I really looked at someone like, I don't know, like David Goggins in sign of, oh, yeah, I want to be like him. I so just, you're your own inspiration. I just want to, like, where I want to be in 10 years' time is always what I'm hitting towards. I'm not sort of, like, that's where I have to be in every time I'm picking up a bag of cement or going up into the loft and just hauling around, like, right, in 10 years' time, this would all be done, so it doesn't matter. So, like, I never have to worry about being tired or getting like all it's all going to crap it's always just i'm looking forward to myself in 10 years pushing time. it forward yeah yeah because that person in 10 years time has done it all and do you network much at all do you network and meet like-minded ne- people at all so this is why i've started <clears throat> something recently with obviously yourself yeah um reaching out to other people uh, i'll have a bit more time now so i should be going to more events but that's i am it's hard to do it's hard to do in the navy because the time off i'm at the house I don't have time to go. If I have time to go, you're to a, always time constrained, aren't you? If if I have time to go and do a like a, a three day course somewhere property networking, then I really should be at the house doing the building work. Yeah, yeah. And because do you think you're going to develop more skills in building, or are you going to just try and do the general labouring site to site stuff, and then maybe hiring subcontractors? What's your plan? So a lot of it probably will be subcontractors, just because be a master like. I could try and be a master of all the trades, but actually understand one of them. Yes. And yeah, you can pick up like point in, ripping walls out. It's all it's all just donkey work. Me and my dad are very good at donkey work. <laughs> so <laughs> it's the hard work. Smart work comes later, but first you have to work hard. Yeah. So yeah. that's I don't see myself becoming like a plasterer or a plumber or electrician. I mean, I've got my electrician calls from the navy, but I I don't really see myself pursuing something. My I say expertise at what little it is just organizing it all because that takes a lot of effort because i'm doing a degree as well um what aren't you doing <laughs> I've, I've, so you're bet- doing all these amazing things so between doing the the course that the navy is which is basically just here's 200 lists learn yeah. 50 and it's a different 200 every single week and you get an exam every week that's that's how the navy works with the exams so i've got that going on then i've got to try and organize leading all the uh all the contractors for the house yeah and then i've 
my girlfriend's like, you need to do your degree, you need to do your degree. And I'm like, wait, just give us a second. And then I'm trying to get over to see her, make sure we do stuff together in London, then go back home to the house. Then you've got to spend time with family members while also being back home because you're not home much. Yeah. And it's just, it's crazy. And then on top of that, I've got me, the boxing coach for the Navy. He's like, oh, are you, are you fighting fit? And I'm just like, do you really think I'll be training? Like, Three times, three times a day, fighting fit, ready with all this going on. I think if I can give you any advice at all, look after your mental and your physical health. So the last three months, I've worked so many hours, I've actually not been able to go to the gym anymore, and I'm so tired, I physically can't. I think I'm more of a shell of a man than I once was, but that's because I've overexerted myself for the amount of work that I'm doing, and I I can see the negative impact that's having on my ability to do what I'm trying to do every day, but. In the past, and I made this my routine for three years straight, I would make sure that I, no matter what, I would always exercise five times a week, minimum. Once a day, Monday through to Sunday, with two rest days. And I would also eat, I would cut away any processed food that's not good for you. I'd always try and eat good, healthy, quality food. So no McDonald's, no fast food. I think the biggest problem when you're working on building sites is there's not really many, you know this already. Yeah, yeah. There's, the only place to go is McDonald's, KFC, Greg's, and it's processed shit yeah. it's not good food it does not keep you going it doesn't fuel you and if you want to sustain where you're going and how you're going to do it and anybody watching this needs to know physical mental health take the time out to look after that then keep pushing forward work should come after that because if you don't look after your own health mentally and physically you're no good to anybody and you're never going to build it and i think that's one the biggest lesson i can give anybody I mean, who I've, wants already, to get I've already seen the back end of that myself because that's something I struggle with because a lot the of the mental or physical side the, the mental side physical I, I, it's I, not spoken about much in men is it no I mean it's a it's a big thing in the Navy because a lot of stuff does get covered up a lot of uh, a lot of lads do struggle in silence I mean my room is tiny it's a box room it's the smallest room you can think of there's a bed in it that's mm. it when I finish work, I'm just in that room all on my own. That's why lads enjoy going out for a drink. Mm. And I'll never knock them for it because I completely understand why Navy lads get a bad rep. All military lads get a bad rep for going for a, going for a drink. But the reality is that's quite a lot of them all they have. And yeah. it's, it's, it's not sad all yeah, they go out drinking, but it's just like... It's their time to socialise. If like, you're in a box room, how are you going to socialise? Yeah, I've, I'm quite lucky that I've got sort of my PC down there and I've chapped all my bits, mates back home, but... Like, for me, it's either go out drinking or go out running. Yeah. And a lot of people don't have the effort to go out running and the, the pub's an awful lot closer than what I'll be running. I think long-term, that might affect your mental health more. Yeah. But I think that's a totally different subject on, yeah. on the drinking. I mean, I personally, I don't like drinking at all. Um, I might have the occasional scotch now and then. I like a good cigar as well. Um, but I, you know, I, I just think alcohol makes the worst version of you. I think people should ease off on military lads. I mean, some of them are idiots and they do act like idiots, but a lot of them are just 17, 18 year old lads for the first time in this big world on their own. Yeah. And they get secluded into this little box room on an evening after they've had a draining sort of nine hours in the classroom or on board. And this yeah. is their just escape. And how do you, so with your mental health in particular, so the Navy aside, from the property aspect, how has, that, how has the property side of things affected your... Struggled, struggled at times. I mean, I, I don't like talking about it, but everybody around me knows, sees the dips, especially yeah. especially towards the start of the project where you just you just see red and you've got contractors ringing you up and... I wish this was an Instagram, as in I wish that people saw this is the reality and not here, look at my Lamborghini or my blacked out Range well, Rover, because that's not how it is. I mean, a lot of I'd say a lot of my posts on Instagram are sarcastic. Okay. Like, to like, the point yeah they're not like they're not horrendously sarcastic but they're kind of just like they're kind of ensuring the fact that I don't have a clue what I'm doing and I'm just kind of stumbling my way along yeah and I don't think I'll ever be one of those people that pose on Instagram I might have the one like sarcastic pose but I'll never make it my entire like personality online because people want to follow the, the real humble life of a property developer yeah I think that's important as well they don't want to see a flash car they don't really care about your holidays in the UAE People want to see you getting nitty gritty down to it and understanding the learning process of property as well. But I've I've definitely struggled with it, especially this is all new to me. And when stuff goes wrong, like I'm halfway through this development now, I'd say easily halfway. And so, well, the the fence on the other house blew off. Yes, and I'm just this it, I mean, this, it's, this it's, happens. Yeah, it's not the it's worst not a, thing. It's not a big thing. I mean, I'm not kind of like crying over it, but it's just like. 
Yes, I know that feeling. And it, it's it's kind of like, I'm just glad it's just a fence because the reality is me and my dad can fix a fence easy. Just note that without being too um, negative on this subject, you will get, as, as your housing portfolio grows, that will carry on. Yeah. yeah. So I got a message the other day, this flat roof's leaking or this is going on and this, and it's just a relentless cycle of maintenance. I think that's why I've done, I don't want to say so well, but I'm kind of growing quick is because my support of my mum and dad, they do a hell of a lot for me. Yeah. And when I'm on base in a classroom at 12 o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon and I get a message from Mark, the guy who owns the house, well, rents it out, or uh, yeah, the, the fence is blown down in the wind and I'm just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I, all I just, I forwarded at my dad saying, is this a problem? Uh, does it need done now? And my, yeah. dad, my dad's straight over there knocking on the door, is everything all right? Is the dog all right? Because that's what my concern was. I was like, oh, is the dog still in the house? Yeah. And the dog's fine. And the, the problem is where the, the fence posts are, it would always be a problem. Uh, it's just, just rotted because that's where all the, the water sort of converges down into. But that's an issue for like another week. It won't it won't get done any time now just because the ground's so wet. So uh, one thing I will say is you've got my number now. Yeah. If you ever need advice, contact me. If you ever need help or support or you just want to talk to someone, you've got my number, contact me. Yeah. But how can people find you and follow your progression on your projects? So it's James Pod Property. Okay. I've got the, uh, I got them made up. There's some signs in the windows on the houses on North Road. Love it, yeah. Uh, it's just like, they've got me a little at Instagram. Yeah, yeah. But, it's with all the Instagram stuff. It's not to be like some kind of influence uh, influencer. I just want to show people how easy it is. Yeah. Well, it's not that easy. Well, easy uh, for you to a point. Yeah, right? but I want to show people how I'm stumbling. Yes, that's what I mean. So I want the to show the reality. Yeah. The, wanna, the, the 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 nitty gritty. The honest. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I want to be just completely comparing. When things go wrong, it's on there. Uh, I I don't want to be kind of causing myself in the fake like, and it's just a bit of fun yes it's just a bit of fun making these these reels because I've just discovered CapCut okay um, yeah 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 so yeah. I just I make because uh, I got sent me other podcast so I just made I made like two or three reels and uh, I mean it's, it's just a bit of fun it's my kind of let me hair down where I just don't have to worry about anything I can just put a big post on Instagram and just yeah whatever what happens it's fine I love it. I love it. And I can't wait to keep on top of your journey on these four flats you're developing. But yeah. James, thank you so much for coming onto the show. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Good luck with everything you do. And yeah, thank you, you for too, joining man. us. And thank I'd you. just like to say to anybody who's watching this podcast, if there's anything you want me to discuss with anybody at all property-wise, please drop it in the comments and let me know.